Adrian for being here. Uh, this is my group pleasure to give my tutorial here. Um, so uh, today I'm going to uh, give some um, introduction on GN methodology and also uh, introduce on a PyG library, uh, which is one of the most popular uh, library for implementing uh, GNs. Um, and uh, also this is like the part one of the tutorial. Uh, my colleague Rexing will give the second part of the tutorial. So for my part, it will last around uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and my name is Jiaxuan Yeo. Um, I'm currently a founding member at Kumo AI, a startup uh, using GN technology uh, to provide a uh, to be service. And I uh, earned my uh, PhD from Stanford University. Um, okay, let me get started. Um, so uh, first quickly, uh, this history of uh, PyG library. Um, as you know, uh, Matthias uh, Fei, uh, was the creator of the PyG and it has become uh, super uh, popular like over the past uh, four years. And last year we have built a larger team uh, for the future development PyG where I'm also a core member. Um, and uh, to make this collaboration, uh, uh, we created like a new PyG website. And you know, we also uh, integrate a lot of tools from uh, different like research institutes and from both academia and industry to make PyG library and community even stronger. Yeah, so this is part of the like the introduction. And now I'm getting uh, started with uh, introducing some basics about uh, graph neural networks for GN. And part of the slides are adapted from the uh, Stanford CS2 for W slides, uh, where I was also like a head TA to create uh, this uh, course materials. So as we know, many types of that data are naturally represented as graphs. Um, so here I show some examples such as a knowledge graph, uh, bioregulatory networks, uh, scene graphs, as we see in images, uh, code graph in any uh, coding uh, 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 coding platforms. Uh, we have molecules where the atom and bounds are uh, nodes and edges, and we can also represent this uh, 3D shapes as uh, some uh, mesh-like uh, graphs. The main question we want uh, to answer here is that how do we take advantage of this relational structure and make better predictions. So our idea here is to uh, use this, uh, deep graph encoders to encode this relational uh, structure. And more concretely, we can uh, take this uh, structure as an input. We can pass through a few uh, different neural network layers and we call them like a, a graph convolutional layers. And then uh, in between these layers, we can inject activation functions, some uh, other like more advanced uh, layers like patch norm, et cetera. And the output of this deep graph encoders are mainly the node embeddings. Uh, but in the meantime, we can also embed uh, subgraphs or entire graphs. Um, uh, but indeed, uh, node embeddings are the most commonly seen concepts uh, in any uh, deep graph encoders. Our solution here is to propose the idea of uh, graph neural networks. And this is like the most popular way to instantiate this deep graph encoder. The idea is that uh, we let a node neighborhood structure to define a computational graph. And more concretely, uh, here I show an example. We suppose we want to uh, encode node i in this um, uh, graph. We will define the computational graph based on this uh, one hop, two hop, up to k hop neighborhood structure. And then we will propagate and transform the information along this computational graph to compute the node embeddings for this uh, node i. So to summarize, the key idea of GN is to learn how to propagate information across the graph to compute node features. Um, and the intuition of this idea is that we always aggregate from neighbors and each uh, neighborhood structure will define a, a unique computational graph. So take this input graph as example, we have multiple nodes, A, B, C, D, uh, up to uh, E. And then we can see because each node has a different neighborhood structure, if we enroll their computational graph, uh, these computational graphs are also different. And this is like the, the core intuition of GN why it works because, uh, because we have different computational graph, uh, we can eventually get different node embeddings to differentiate these nodes. And then we can use it for more advanced downstream application. Next, I'm going to go through like a general GN framework uh, just to uh, like a, have a brief uh, overview of how a full GN system could work. So usually the first step of uh, defining a full GN framework is that we want to define a layer well. 
and a G layer can almost always decompose into two parts, a message function and an aggregation function. Uh, and by the way, uh, like uh, under uh, PyG library, the core implementation also follow the same principle. We have a message and aggregation function to support any PyG layers. Um, and to be more concrete, in the message function, uh, we'll gather uh, the information from neighboring nodes, um, and then we'll apply some message or nonlinear transformation over these um, neighbors. And then in the aggregation phase, we'll apply like uh, aggregation over all the neighbors um, from a given node. And these aggregation functions could be as simple as say a, a mean function or a sum function, or be more complex, say um, uh, attention-based aggregation function. And uh, based on this uh, idea of message plus aggregation, uh, different uh, gene layers are just different instantiations under this perspective. For example, uh, you may heard of some popular uh, gene layers uh, called a graph convolutional network, um, graph sage, graph attention network, etc. And these are uh, these uh, specific networks are different instantiations of, under this perspective. Uh, after defining a gene layer. Next, we want to uh, connect these different layers into a full uh, graph neural network. And the natural way uh, of connecting them is just to stack these layers together. Uh, however, we can uh, make this uh, schema more complex. Uh, for example, it is open advised that you can add skip connections between these layers so that it can uh, prevent the over smoothing problem as encountered in a uh, graph neural network. And you can also make the connection even uh, more complex. Um, and another good uh, thing to point out that usually uh, helps a lot by uh, adding some pre or post processing layers uh, before and after this uh, GN layers. For example, you could add some uh, MLP layers to prepare us your uh, uh, like a raw features uh, before feeding into GN. And then after GN processing, you can also add a few MLP layers um, to uh, further transform the node embedding learned by GN. And this is often uh, quite useful um, in a lot of domain applications. And after defining a GN network, uh, the next is to uh, specify the uh, full computational graph. Um, and so far, uh, our idea has been uh, the, that we define a computational graph based on the raw input graph. But it turns out that um, in reality, this may not over uh, the case. And we can actually uh, make a lot of uh, augmentation regarding the graph feature and the graph structure. So that will make the computational graph different from the raw input graph. Um, to be more specific, uh, we can augment the graph features. For example, in a lot of cases, the graphs does not have like a concrete uh, features. And there the, uh, the stand, standard approach is to add some uh, constant vectors or one hot vectors as the node features. And also we can make the features more meaningful by adding some graph statistics. Um, for example, we can use node degree as the uh, node feature or the cycle count around certain node um, be the node feature. And um, uh, some research have shown that, for example, adding this uh, cycle count information can actually make the uh, GN more expressive, more powerful. Another way of making augmentation is to uh, augment the graph structure. And more specifically, we can add some uh, virtual nodes or virtual edges uh, to make the connectivity of a GN denser. And this way we can let the uh, GN propagate message uh, more smoothly and getting better embeddings. Um, another often uh, common solution, especially for large, um, large scale graphs, is to make mini batch or subgraph sampling around um, like a large graph. And this way, the specific computational graph is not uh, the same as the raw input graph, but we can uh, trade this uh, in exchange for uh, like a more scalability and uh, faster processing. And um, finally, having defined the network, defined the connectivity, uh, we will define the learning objective um, for a, a graph neural network. And this is uh, about how do we train a uh, GN. And here I, I just list uh, two type, types of uh, objectives you usually need to de decide when defining your problem. Um, for example, uh, you can use uh, standard supervised learning objectives. And so usually this is quite straightforward, like a classification or regression based objectives. Uh, you can also uh, inject some unsupervised objectives based on your problem setting. And some very popular um, solution here is to, for example, define link prediction 
um, that is to uh, predict the missing links in your network. Uh, we can use constructive learning to uh, differentiate a pair of different uh, graph inputs or uh, some more popular um, uh, recent solutions to uh, use mask feature prediction. That is you mask some uh, parts of your node features and pre predict them back. So these are some uh, good uh, objectives you can consider for your uh, unsupervised learning uh, objectives. Um, and then uh, we also have different node, edge, and graph level objectives. And this is really based on your uh, downstream uh, solution task. Um, for example, um, you could predict uh, features about a specific node. You can predict features around a pair of nodes based on uh, an edge, and you can classify uh, among different graphs. And usually the solution here is just based on the combination of node embeddings. So that's why uh, node embedding is kind of the building block uh, core concept in uh, GM. Uh, to summarize, um, to have your uh, full GN framework, usually you need to uh, define your GN layer. You need to define how to connect the layers together. Um, and then we define uh, the augmented augmentation needed uh, about the feature and the structure. And finally, define the learning objective that is suited for your specific task of interest. So um, because of short of time, this is just a very quick overview of uh, what we have for uh, uh, GN framework and the basics. Um, and next, um, I'm going to introduce uh, GraphGym as an easy to use API for graph learning. And GraphGym has now become like a core part of uh, the PyG library as well. Um, the motivation of this work is that uh, we found that it's quite challenging to implement a full GM pipeline. Um, for example, you may uh, use PyG uh, where you can import like a GCN uh, COM layer um, to facilitate your uh, GM implementation. However, we notice that there's a gap uh, between this like a GN layer and a full GN pipeline. And more specifically, there are a lot of design choices you want to uh, make uh, before you can uh, make your GN pipeline successful. For example, how to manipulate the uh, raw input data and how to design your GN architecture, how to handle different uh, prediction tasks uh, like the node edge and graph level task, and how to evaluate your performance uh, properly. So you see there are a lot of um, um, like the details you need to figure out before you make the full pipeline work. The second challenge we found that is usually uh, challenging to find uh, the best uh, GN designs. Our observation here is that the design space for all the possible GN is huge. And we can easily define uh, millions of uh, different possible uh, GN models. For example, you can uh, have different GN layers like uh, GCN, GrabSage, uh, GAT. You can apply different aggregation like a mean, sum, and max aggregators. Uh, you can inject different operators into your network, like whether to add batch norm, dropout, or L2 norm. And you see that there are exponential possibilities um, when we consider all these design dimensions. So the challenge here uh, is that, um, the challenge here uh, is that uh, the best gene designs for different tasks are actually also very different. So uh, we found that a state of our gene in one task may actually perform pretty badly in another task. Um, for example, here I show a figure. Um, we can vary the aggregator among uh, max, min, and sum. And we found that in some data set like this BZR data set, max aggregator is actually performing the best. Um, whereas in this uh, small world data set, sum aggregator is uh, performing the best. Um, so this, uh, this observation is quite common where uh, like a good GN performs well in one task, I may perform badly in another task. The third challenge is to customize a GM pipeline. Um, suppose uh, in uh, your research or in your application, you want to uh, define a new GM layer called uh, ABCOM. And the common workflow here is that um, either you want to fork an open source pipeline that uh, use your new ABCOM and where you need to repurpose the pipeline to the data set or uh, task that you need. Uh, the issue here is that um, because uh, a new pipeline is needed and you, you, whenever you want to try something new, uh, you have to redo this uh, pipeline, uh, uh, this process again. Another solution is that you can apply, adapt your existing GM pipeline where you can replace your GCN COM uh, with this uh, new AB COM. Uh, but the issue here is that you need to uh, really edit your code. So your uh, core pipeline code needs to be altered. And this is also uh, not uh, uh, scalable or elegant. So the most common issue is that whenever you want to customize your dream pipeline, 
is often involved laborious uh, in inefficiency, et cetera. And we propose a graph dream library that can address these common, uh, these, uh, common challenges. Uh, regarding challenge one, um, to uh, when you implement like a GM pipeline, graph dream provides a modularized GM pipeline uh, where we can help users explore a giant GM design space. Uh, regarding challenge two, where we want to find the best GM design for a specific task, graph dream features a simple API for managing this, uh, GM experiments. And we can easily launch and analyze thousands of experiments at ease. Regarding uh, challenge three, uh, about uh, customizing a specific GM pipeline, uh, Graph Dream allows user to easily register the customized modules. And this way you can increase visibility and the impact of a set of our research. Um, to be more specific um, about uh, Graph Dream, we have this modularized uh, GM pipeline um, implementation. And what I mean is that uh, we have, for example, a create loader function uh, that can help you load your graph we have create a model function that can create a different uh, GN setup. Uh, we have say, for example, on head dictionary, they can select among different level of prediction head. And we can also uh, let user even uh, easily select the best optimizer and best uh, loss uh, for the uh, computation. And we also have a very, uh, like, a, uh, like a sophisticated uh, GN design space that can cover a lot of uh, design dimensions. Um, so uh, here we have some intra layer design about uh, like a specific gene layer, such as whether adding the batch norm, dropout activation uh, function, aggregation function, et cetera. Um, and we have also have this inter layer design uh, where we focus on how to connect this gene layer together and adding the pre and post processing layers. Um, and we also have a configuration regarding the learning pipeline, uh, like uh, uh, the batch size learning rate optimizer, et cetera. And uh, in total, um, the basic uh, design space have uh, 300,000 uh, possible designs. And if you consider a full design space, that's uh, about like a bil even billions of possible designs. And in Graph Dream, we also feature like a, a nice experiment uh, configuration uh, system uh, where uh, what, uh, each experiment is fully described by a configuration file. And you can find that you can always reproduce the experiment by just keeping this configuration file. Uh, the configuration file can uh, define your data set, your uh, training scheme, uh, the GM model architecture, optimizer, and more. And to run a ex uh, specific experiment, uh, you can just uh, like uh, run your code and pass in this, uh, a configuration file. Um, and it's, uh, this way, it's also easy for us to uh, launch a batch of experiments. Um, for example, you can um, use Graph Dream to do grid search over experimental uh, settings uh, where uh, you can also write the uh, configuration file and you can define like the different data sets you want to run over and the different model combinations you want to explore. Um, and then uh, this way you can launch the gene experiment in parallel in just two lines. And this can easily scale to thousands of experiments um, and will utilize all the GPUs in your system. Um, so here, for example, we generate uh, like a configuration of a, a grid of experiments we defined above. Uh, and then we will launch a batch of experiments. Uh, and here we can also specify that each experiment will repeat for three random seeds. And then we allow the system to run eight experiments simultaneously to uh, parallelize uh, your experiments. And finally, uh, Graph Dream also offers an automatic interface to summarize experiment results and figures. Um, so, here we export a CSV files that uh, summarize like what is the configuration of one experiment and what are all the metrics you wish to um, uh, evaluate over. And this is aggregated from uh, all the random seeds. And we can also have this uh, uh, figurative uh, API uh, where we can show uh, what is the best design uh, over the experiments you have launched. Um, for example, here you can see that um, the sum aggregation is performing the best and rank the highest among all the other design choices. And this can help you to make a informed decision about uh, which designs are good and which designs are bad. And uh, another uh, highlight is that for Graph Dream, we can use it to register the customized module you may want to add. Um, so for example, you may come up with a new uh, GN layer called example column, 
and you can have your uh, uh, implementation just as a, any uh, PyG functions. And then after that, you can call like a register layer um, uh, command. Just uh, this way you can register this layer to grab dream and it can be later called by any uh, future code, code you write. Um, and for example, uh, in your grid search, you can search and compare between a GCN comp and the exact example comp you have uh, newly created. And um, um, in, in PyG Graph Gym, we can actually support a customized modules among like uh, all the key building blocks of our GM pipeline. Um, and next, I'm going to talk about some uh, application of Graph Gym in research. Um, for example, um, in one uh, research that I have wrote uh, in the previous, uh, previously, we use Graph Gym to validate a newly proposed uh, gene layer called uh, IDGN. And we can use Graph Gym to make ensure a fair comparison uh, because here we fix all the remaining um, hyperparameters except that we switch this uh, one gene layer. So we fix all the natural structure of the learning configuration the same. And also this way we can control the computational budget for all the model to be exactly the same. And we want to show that this new uh, model, uh, IDGN, is consistently outperforming uh, uh, the graph conversion neural network. And to do this, we need to uh, experiment over four different GM backbones uh, uh, around uh, 20 different node edge and graph level tasks. Uh, for each task, we want to reproduce three, uh, three random seeds. And then we want to compare over uh, uh, two GM layers, IDGN versus GCN. And th this, uh, in total, this uh, concludes 480 different experiments. And you can imagine if you have to manually run this experiment, how elaborate it is. But with GraphGM, launching this uh, 480 experiment just takes three lines of code. We generate this uh, like base um, uh, grid search file. Uh, we run the experiments uh, in uh, 10 uh, parallel processes, and then we'll aggregate the results uh, using the interface provided by GraphGM. Um, so you can see that this interface really greatly simplified uh, any uh, uh, research you may have. Um, regarding uh, the history and future of GraphGM, uh, GraphGM was originally proposed uh, in 2020, uh, where uh, we have this newest paper and our original code uh, uh, released from Stanford. Uh, and later, uh, last year, uh, GraphGM had, has uh, become like a core component of PyG uh, in the PyG 2.0 release. And you can uh, try GraphGM out by just installing uh, Torch Geometric as, as usual. Um, and for me, I'm also excited to be a core PyG team member to continually uh, contribute to PyG community. And we are continuously working on better and deeper integration of, of between the graph gym and PyG. Okay, uh, next, uh, uh, the final section of my talk, I will talk about uh, how do we combine graph gym and PyG on uh, financial uh, networks. So this is like a specific application uh, about uh, uh, financial use cases. And we also have a published uh, paper around this topic in uh, KDD this year. Um, so in this uh, application, we talk about financial networks. And financial networks really describe the financial entities and their uh, connections. Um, for example, we can have this uh, banking network where the different uh, nodes are different countries and edges are the capital flows or you can consider a Bitcoin transactions where nodes are different wallets and edges are the uh, transactions. Um, when we apply graph learning in financial networks, uh, the goal here is that uh, uh, we'll like uh, transform the input uh, financial networks into a, a graph neural network computational graph, and then we can use it to uh, embed nodes, uh, nodes embeddings and then use the embeddings for different level of tasks. An example application involves uh, fraud detection, anti-money uh, anti laundering, and anomaly detection. And we can just uh, use the standard graph representation learning tools uh, for the uh, financial networks applications. Um, so before we proceed, uh, it's a good uh, a question to ask that why do we need graph representation here? So uh, in the past, people have been using transaction-based approach um, for financial networks. Um, for example, uh, in the banking system, there are like a, maybe a large SQL database where it shows that on a specific date, uh, client A sends company B $500. And then uh, people would build uh, prediction models uh, based on this uh, transaction uh, attributes. 
the issue here is that um, without considering graph structure, it really ignores the context of a given transaction. Uh, because for example, this client A may also send company C right after this uh, transaction. But if you can do not consider a whole picture of a graph, then uh, you lose this kind of information. And then with graph-based approach, uh, we wish to represent these transactions as a dynamic graph. And, uh, and then we will make predictions based on the entire graph information. And the benefit is that this way we can represent the transaction record with a broader context. And this also requires a fewer uh, feature engineering. And uh, in this uh, research, we propose Roland as a GN framework for financial network. Um, and the key idea of Roland is that we'll transform the financial networks as a GN computational graph. Um, so um, for example, here we have a financial network among clients, bank and company, and each edge uh, defines like a transaction between different entities. We'll convert this financial network into a, a graph neural network, uh, where the idea is that we'll um, like a, define a small neural network, which is a GN layer uh, for each edge. And this way we can allow the information uh, being propagated among different entities. Um, and finally, we will learn the system through diverse signals. And these signals can be either self-supervised or unsupervised from the raw data, uh, such as predicting whether there will be a transaction, what is the transaction amount, and when the transaction will happen, or some supervised learning objectives. For example, um, is this transaction a fraud or is this involved for money laundering activities? And uh, through this framework, we can uh, easily learn from financial networks and support a lot of downstream uh, applications. Um, the key challenge here is that how do we transform static GN to dynamic GNs? Um, so uh, for example, uh, the uh, typical approach uh, people would come up is that we can like uh, have a static uh, financial network. We can pass it through, uh, pass it, uh, through a uh, state of our static GN. And then um, we will guide the GN by uh, predicting, for example, is this edge like a fraudulent edge? So we can uh, use this system uh, to train the neural network and get node embeddings. Uh, but the question is that the financial networks are constantly changing over time. And can we adapt a state of art static gene to this uh, dynamic prediction tasks? So our idea here is that we want to um, convert like a, any static gene to a dynamic gene with minimal ch changes. Um, and our idea is to recurrently update the node embedding at each layer. So this is different from like uh, adding a top uh, RN over a GN layers, but we really want to inject uh, like an embedding update layer um, to each GN layer. So this way we introduce like a new module called embedding update to any possible uh, static GN, where the input is the previous embedding from the same GN layer and um, the current embedding from the previous layer. So we look at uh, the previous layer and look at the past information. Um, and the output of this uh, module is an updated embedding that can be used for the next layer and used for the future. And uh, the benefit of this approach is that first is uh, really simple and effective and you really requires minimal change to your uh, static GN architecture. And also we can benefit from any state of our designs from a static GN and use it for dynamic networks. We also have like an efficient uh, training uh, scheme uh, based on, on this role uh, for this role and framework. Um, so um, in reality, the financial network will be uh, constantly updated. So we propose like an in incremental training scheme uh, where we only keep um, the GE model, the historical node states, uh, the incoming new, new graph uh, snapshots into GPU. And this way is really efficient and work well in, uh, in practice uh, for training large scale uh, dynamic networks. Uh, we also have a novel meta training sch uh, schema here uh, where uh, we train a meta GN that can quickly adapt to the new data. And this way, uh, Roland do not need to be constantly frequently retrained uh, to adapt to new, uh, uh, new dynamic graphs. Uh, and we implement Roland uh, using PyG and GraphGM. And uh, GraphGM here uh, offers a standard pipeline for uh, graph learning uh, and so we, as we have already introduced. And we can uh, fully benefit from the general gene design space uh, offered from GraphGM and transfer uh, the implementation to dynamic graphs. 
Um, here I quickly show like an example financial data set that we have. Um, so this data set uh, records transactions between companies as captured by a, a banking a banking clearing system. And there are over 300 million different transactions, uh, 6 million accounts and six years of daily data. And here we show uh, the distribution of, of the transaction amount and the degree distribution and also the distribution of the uh, history lens of uh, the existence of a given dynamic node. Um, in the first task, uh, we wish to classify and detect those uh, fraud transactions. And this is uh, like a standard supervised learning uh, 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 setting. Uh, but the challenge here is that the data set is really unbalanced. Uh, only 2% of all the transactions are fraudulent. And also the, uh, and we, uh, to, uh, we also apply like standard uh, random data set split, 80% uh, of training, 10 validation, and 10% of testing. Um, and we use uh, the standard AOC metric uh, to report a performance. Um, here we show that the best non-deep learning baseline, uh, we only achieve around 0.8 AUC. Um, and using the standard auto box uh, PyG uh, static GN implementation, uh, we also didn't get good performance. Uh, but with Roland framework based on uh, GraphGen PyG, uh, we actually get much better uh, performance with AOC of 0.9694. Um, in the second task, uh, we want to focus on uh, future transactions. And the task setting here is that um, uh, it's really like a self-supervised or unsupervised learning. Um, here we define like a rolling prediction setting uh, where on each day, we use all the historical information to predict uh, the transactions on the next day. And we use uh, the ranking law, a uh, ranking metric uh, called a mean reciprocal ranking and to, report, uh, to uh, compare the predictions uh, with the ground truth uh, future transaction. Uh, here we also compare uh, uh, Roland with a lot of other state of our gene architecture for dynamic graphs. And we show that uh, this Roland idea significantly outperform other state of our baselines. Um, so the key lessons we learned here that uh, by uh, transforming the architecture novelty from the static uh, GN to dynamic ones, we can really achieve a significant performance improvement. Um, and I also show some analysis about Roland's performance over time. Um, so um, in the uh, first row, we show the transaction amount over time. Um, and then in the second row, uh, we show the number of uh, retraining epoch uh, that are needed from Roland to perform training. Um, the reason of retraining is that you can see that there are, these are some uh, pattern changes about the transactions. And uh, because uh, the patterns have been changed, we need to retrain the model to fit uh, the new data. And uh, finally, the final, last row is the performance of Roland um, over time. And you can see that Roland maintains a robust uh, performance over the just transaction pattern changes by automatically retraining to fit the data. data. Um, and I also show some uh, like uh, interpretable results about Roland's predictions. Um, for example, um, here uh, we have this uh, uh, different attentions between uh, like uh, the low attention edges and high attention edges. And um, the question we ask here is that what kind of transactions did the model pay attention to? Um, and for example, here uh, we have found that this uh, uh, non-financial entities to household entities has uh, like a more uh, attention weight uh, among the high attention edges. And also this uh, domestic to abroad um, transactions has a more attention uh, about uh, uh, being focused about the model as well. So you can see that the model can uh, indeed have some more interpretable results and uh, that can inform uh, future uh, decisions. Uh, to summarize this part of uh, one of our tutorial, uh, we have covered the background regarding the basics of our GM model. Uh, we have talked about GraphGM as an uh, easy to use API for graph learning, and it has been fully integrated into the PyG library. Um, and also talk about like a short application uh, where we use PyG and GraphGM on financial networks. Um, I also list uh, my email and webpage if you want to reach out and get connected. And, and next, uh, my colleague uh, Rex Yin, uh, we will talk about the uh, PyG library and more application he has uh, encountered in his uh, research. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jashen. Uh... Um, I'll, I'll get started. And um, a lot of the material that I'll talk about uh, also are also related to um, um, 
uh, fundamental GNNs, and um, specifically, I will be talking about the uh, the framework that we um, uh, developed for uh, a library for graph neural networks. Uh, and then later, I'll also talk about the application if there is no time. Um, right. So, um, so yeah, I get started. Uh, the um, the project that I'm going to introduce uh, to you today is about uh, Python geometric. So actually, the creator of PyG, uh, Matthias, was going to uh, give this talk, but um, unfortunately, he has some uh, time conflicts. So I'll be giving a talk instead. So this, um, so we, we're the team behind the Python geometric, and uh, core members include Matthias, uh, Jashwin, uh, myself, uh, Jan, Yuri, and many others. Um, and the goal of this project is to uh, make it very easy for people to use and implement graph neural networks uh, in both academic and uh, industrial settings. Uh, so very brief uh, um, introduction on like why we do this. Uh, uh, as you probably have already seen in the previous uh, uh, talk, um, modern deep learning toolbox is uh, usually designed for uh, you know, images, text, or uh, general you know, matrix. Uh, um, like matrix operation, like uh, 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 learning frameworks, whereas uh, the input of graph is usually uh, much different and challenging. For example, you have arbitrary size, you can have variable number of nodes, you have complex topological structure, there's no node ordering or like inherent uh, 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 notion of direction in, in, in graph, and it is often dynamic you know, nodes and edges changes over time. Uh, and finally, uh, we can have nodes and edges that uh, represent different types or like multi-nodal features. For example, uh, a node can actually represent a user. It can represent items. It can represent, uh, um, uh, you know, even images and text and different kinds of uh, data modalities. So this all makes uh, implementing uh, GNNs relatively more complex. Um, but I will introduce uh, uh, PyG, which uh, ideally should make this very easy. Um, so, um, Python Geometric is a library that enables deep learning on graphs, um, as well as point clouds and manifolds, you know, different, uh, different uh, data uh, data formats that are not uh, directly can, that cannot directly be represented as a grid or a regular uh, uh, sequence structure. Um, so, it aims to simplify uh, implementation and. Uh, uh, make it very easy for uh, graph neural networks to be implemented in uh, various uh, applications and uh, research. Um, it will bundle uh, state-of-the-art GNN architectures and training procedures, as we'll see uh, a lot of actually uh, state-of-the-art GNNs are uh, implemented in uh, Python geometric already, and that makes it really easy to uh, you know, make use of um, any of these architectures or uh, you know, make small adjustments or uh, uh, changes to the architecture. Uh, uh, in an existing GNN. Um, additionally, it achieves high GPU throughput on highly sparse data. So we have a, um, um, a torch sparse or uh, current uh, now going to be transferred to uh, PyGlib, uh, like a backend library, which is implemented in C++ that makes uh, sparse operations and sampling and many other essential parts of the GNN to be very, very fast. And it is both used uh, for academia and industry. So we have a short update that the team behind PyG has founded a new startup called Kumo, uh, which is built on top of PyG. And uh, the company will continue to provide support to PyG in various ways. And it is uh, it is going to, uh, still going to be an open source library, which everyone can contribute to. So um, uh, I'll been, uh, talk a bit, little bit about it in a very high level. Uh, so uh, as you will probably see, uh, PyG is very easy to be used and uh, uh, it is completely based on uh, uh, PyTorch syntax. Uh, so as you can see on the left here, uh, uh, we have a, um, a traditional ConfNet module. And uh, on the right here, we have a, a GNN module, uh, which um, uh, it looks very similar, right? Uh, so on a high level, we have this NN module um, called GNN, and uh, we define some convolution operators. So instead of 2D conf, we now define, say, like a graph convolution GC and conf, um, uh, specifying the dimensions of the input and output. And we can have a forward function, which is called during the forward pass. Um, um, so 
in this flow function, in addition to the input, which is now a graph instead of a 2D image, now we additionally pass in this edge index, which, uh, um, which is essentially the adjacency matrix, right? The sparse adjacency matrix. So on the first line, you have the starting nodes. On the second line, you have the uh, end nodes. So it's going to be a matrix, uh, a tensor of dimension two times number of edges, right? And then the, everything else is very similar. You know, you uh, give a convolution, you have a nonlinearity and etc. cetera. Right? Um, and you can plug in this uh, module everywhere. So uh, it can even be stacked, you can, uh, you know, you can have, uh, uh, a more complex module that uses this module, et cetera. So everything else is very similar to PyTorch. Um, and and under, under the hood, uh, uh, in order to build this uh, interface, we have uh, various components that are essential to the library. So first of all, we have the uh, engine, um, which is the underlying library that uh, um, PyG is dependent on. Obviously, it uh, depends on PyTorch. Um, but uh, it is also worth mentioning that we have the Torch Scatter, which is a CUDA library or like a C++ library that implements the operation of scatter in both CPU and GPU. And this operation is essential to uh, making the forward path of GNNs very efficient. Um, and another library is called Torch Sparse, which is currently mainly used for two purposes. One is for sparse matrix operations uh, and uh, for example, sparse sparse matrix multiplication. Uh, these uh, um, these implementations will soon uh, also be uh, part of uh, um, um, Nvidia and uh, Intel libraries, and uh, so we're uh, in active collaboration with them to provide like a better experience for that. And another purpose of it is uh, for sampling. So as we know that in very large GNNs, we typically want to sample the neighbors and so on. And uh, TorchSpot also provides utilities for sampling. So uh, these are the underlying engines and all, uh, all of which are written in C++, uh, which makes the uh, uh, entire framework very efficient. And the next component is the storage. Uh, which uh, mainly uh, handles how data is stored and transformed in, uh, 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 in PyTorch geometric. So when we feed in graphs, uh, it will be stored as a data object and uh, many data objects will form a data set, which can either contain you know, one graph with many neighborhoods or many, many graphs. And we are able to perform different kinds of transformations via uh, tensor operations, many of which are already uh, um, written for, uh, uh, for us, so uh, it will be very easy to call these transforms on the data uh, as a pre-processing step. So these include different kinds of graph transformations. Um, and on top of that, we also have different data loaders, which uh, controls how we load the data or uh, how we load the graphs into batches of training data. So these will be feed fed into GPU uh, for later training purposes. Uh, so these uh, data loaders including uh, includes uh, how we do mini batching for different graphs, how we sample neighborhoods, how we even sample subgraphs. So these are different uh, scalable uh, GNN approaches that require different kinds of sampling. Um, the next uh, component is, uh, is the operator. And the most, uh, um, the most visible one uh, is going to be the message passing class, which uh, uh, basically controls um, how we perform message passing. Uh, for each layer at each layer of the GNN. So uh, there are already many message passing classes that are implemented, including GCNCOM, GATCOM, GraphSageCOM, uh, SageCOM, et cetera. Um, um, and um, uh, to, in order to develop a new uh, message passing scheme, it is also very easy uh, to just inherit uh, uh, the base class of message passing and uh, make some adjustments there. Um, and um, and in addition to the message passing class, we also have uh, support for uh, you know, pooling operations, uh, which is used for graph classification uh, um, and also normalization of uh, layers uh, for graphs, as well as uh, different kinds of readout functions. Uh, so these readout functions will be directly tied to the tasks, right? So if it's node classification, there will be a a different readout as link prediction um, or, or as a graph classification and so on. Um, and, and on top of that, we have the uh, model component, uh, which has the uh, many different user defined models, uh, for example, like GC and Conv, et cetera, which we already talked about. Uh, it is very easy to call them, uh, but we are also uh, supporting many, uh, uh, sorry, we're also supporting um, 
um, like defining the models itself. Right, so we can uh, very easily uh, use the message parsing class to write our own GNN model. Um, and in addition to that, we have many predefined models and examples that we can use. Um, so far, uh, is there any questions? Okay, then I'll continue. Um, so, um, so yeah, good. Uh, so I will uh, go very briefly on this since we have already talked about uh, how GNNs are defined. Right, so. Um, um, given a graph, right? Uh, we have uh, the node features, and uh, we have the add in the, uh, edge indices, which are the adjacency matrices. And sometimes we also have edge features that are associated with edges. Um, and a um, a GNN is typically defined at each layer as these different steps. So first of all, we compute a message function. The message function is compute for every edge of the uh, of the graph. So we have the starting node features H J. Right, and the end node feature HI and the edge feature optionally uh, uh, EJI. And based on this information, we can compute a message for each edge and we can do a um, permutation invariant aggregation. Uh, for example, like sum, mean, max, and different kinds of aggregation. Uh, so um, at every layer for each node uh, J, uh, for example, in this case, the node one on the left, uh, we can aggregate information from all these neighbors, for example, two, three, and four, right? And and these messages, after these me messages gets uh, aggregated, we will do an update, right? So the current, uh, uh, the center node uh, features are then updated with the aggregated messages through this update function. And, and this, uh, in implementation can, uh, is a uh, parallelizable operation that uses this uh, scatter and gather operation. Uh, so, um, so now we have, for example, we have these messages from uh, two, three, and four respectively. We can use a parallel gather um, uh, to compute the uh, aggregated message uh, for this uh, particular node, node one. Um, and, and we can now, uh, uh, after we uh, gather the them, we can use a scatter operation uh, uh, to compute the aggregation of them uh, of all these uh, uh, messages, um, and after that we will do an update, uh, which um, uh, you also uses the node feature itself, the input node feature itself to uh, also uh, uh, compute the next layer representation. So uh, now, we, uh, as we see, there is a superscript here called L, um, which denotes uh, the the number of layers, and uh, we use uh, um, the features or the embeddings at layer L to compute the uh, embedding at layer L plus one. Um, yeah, so uh, so this is like a basic implement. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't mind. Um, so um, this covers like a basic uh, uh, implementation of uh, GNN under the hood. And uh, in addition, um, PyG covers a large number of state-of-the-art GNS architectures, and it can be easily extended to fit uh, many uh, uh, specific use cases. So for example, these are all uh, convolution layers that have already been implemented in uh, PyG. So using them will be as easy as just directly calling it as a module, uh, it's very similar to Conf2D. So there is very minimal effort needed for these existing uh, uh, GNN layers and GNN models are uh, models or NN uh, torch modules that is built on top of these layers. For example, uh, uh, DGI, for example, um, is a semi supervised uh, uh, GNN framework, um, which uh, internally can use you know, different kinds of uh, message passing. Say, let's use uh, 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 GC and Conf uh, and uh, DGI, in addition to defining different uh, layers as a uh, GCN comp, it will also define its own loss function and objective so that we can train uh, this uh, uh, self supervised uh, 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 GNN framework end to end. Um, and, and now I will talk a little bit about uh, mini batching uh, uh, on small graphs. So, um, as we all know, sometimes our data set can consist of uh, multiple graphs. Right. Um, and, and our mini batch uh, at every iteration can uh, contain more than one graph, right? So uh, suppose that we have a mini batch of two graphs and every iteration will pass in two graphs. Um, uh, this time it will be like graph one, two, next time it could be graph three, four, next time it could be graph four, one, et cetera. So how do we um, uh, support these kind of applications where at every mini batch we have a variable 
uh, so we have different uh, different input graphs. Um, so the high level idea is that uh, we can uh, make this uh, mini batch as a um, and uh, a single graph with uh, two different connected components if we have two input graphs. And the adjacency will just be you know, a diagonal adjacency, which uh, in turn will get represented as a sparse representation. Uh, and that implies that we actually have to increment the indices for the second adjacency matrix so that it starts with a uh, number of nodes in the first matrix plus one, right? so that uh, the, index is, uh, in the index is consistent. And in addition to that, we also augment the feature matrix as a concatenation of both matrices. And, um, and we do this without any modification to the uh, GNN architecture. And uh, uh, it is also very efficient, so we don't have any overhead. Uh, and this is all automatically being done in the data loader of PyG. Um, um, yeah, this is a very simple example. So let's say we load this IMDB binary graph data set and we specify that at every iteration, we want to use 128 graphs. And uh, we just need to define the batch size and the data loader, which is uh, part of the Python geometric data loader, uh, already takes care of that. Um, and again, uh, this is another use case uh, where uh, we uh, support the mini batching for large single giant graphs. So instead of like multiple small graphs uh, at every mini batch, now we have this giant graph input graph. Let's say it's a, a huge uh, social network with say one billion uh, nodes. And in order to train that on GPU, which might or might not fit uh, the entire uh, graph uh, and as well as the features, we now uh, do, for example, mini batch uh, training. So instead of uh, passing the entire graph into the GPU, we pass in a neighborhood because all we know is uh, uh, all we need is uh, to compute, say, representation of A is actually all its neighbors, right? So let's uh, suppose that we have a two layer GNN, which means that. A will get messages from its one hop neighbors, which will in turn get its messages from the two hop neighbors, right? So all we need is actually to extract a ego graph or like a uh, uh, local computation tree from the uh, giant graph, right? So at every mini batch, we will have you know, a few nodes uh, whose uh, representation needs to be uh, um, computed. And for each node, we will extract this computation tree, local computation tree, which is essentially like a two hop Hugo network and uh, something like that uh, for each node. And sometimes we also need to do sampling. So let's say A has 100 vertices, uh, neighbors, then instead of uh, using all 100 uh, neighbors in this computation tree, we can say let's only sample 10 of them. And that's already uh, also being taken care of. Um, and on the right, you can see how this is implemented. It's also very easy. Uh, so instead of using the uh, data loader, now we use a neighbor loader, loader and uh, we obtain the data from the uh, from the Reddit data set, and we call uh, neighbor loader with batch size 128, which means that at every mini batch we have 128 computation trees to be considered, right? So that we can com compute uh, 100 uh, the representations of uh, 128 nodes in the in the graph, and we also specify the number of neighbors here. 25, 10 means that at the first layer we fixed sample uh, 25 neighbors, and for every uh, one hop neighbor um, in the uh, in the computation tree. We in addition sample ten of the two hop neighbors at that, uh, at the second layer, right? And um, and again, this is very easy. Now we just need to loop over the batch loader, very similar to uh, the native data loader in PyTorch. Um, and and these are some of the uh, scalable GNN models that actually use uh, uh, such many batch and allows you to train on extremely large. Uh, industrial uh, scale graphs. Um, and, and there are many different tests that are, are uh, supported at PyTorch Geometric. Uh, so these are basically different kinds of tests uh, on the graph. You can make predictions on nodes. You can make a prediction on whether there exists a link in the graph, or you can make prediction on uh, the class of the, or the property of the entire graph, right? Suppose that you have a data set of uh, say, uh, uh, 1,000 graphs, and for each graph you have a label, and now this allows you to make prediction of that. This is called graph classification, and um, it's not also uh, it's not limited to this. Uh, we also have uh, support for unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning, uh, uh, future learning, pre-training, explainability, and different kinds of uh, gen and tasks and modules. Um, and 
and Pygee also supports uh, loading of uh, data set, as you probably can see in the previous, uh, um, previous slides. We just need to uh, specify, say, we want to load Reddit, we want to load uh, um, um, Cora and OGB and many other data sets, and it, it is very easy uh, with Pygee because uh, uh, there are already automatic uh, scripts that downloads these data sets for you. Um, yeah, and there are some additional features as well. So we have um, uh, the uh, just-in-time compiler for GNNs, uh, which is supported by PyTorch. Uh, we also support using a PyTorch Lightning, uh, which means that uh, it becomes very easy to you know, train a model. We don't even have to write the training loop. We can just call trainer.fit, and, uh, and PyTorch Lightning is going to uh, run the GNN for you. Uh, uh, and it's going to do the testing for you as well. Um, and in addition, we also have support for explainability through uh, Captain, uh, which is also very easy to use um, um, uh, in order to obtain explain, uh, explainable results for the network, like why, uh, uh, for example, what are the important edges and features for a given GNN. Um, and there are many success stories uh, uh, many people have uh, have been using it. so this is probably already a bit outdated uh, since it was a uh, 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 screenshot uh, from uh, last year uh, but uh, it's uh, since been actively growing and uh, there are many uh, um, additional libraries on top of PyG that uh, makes it uh, uh, a very uh, good uh, use, use experience um, and and uh, it also uh, supports OGB, which is called Open Graph Benchmark, uh, a, an effort from Stanford that uh, proposed several data sets for uh, evaluations of uh, uh, state-of-the-art GNN models. And it is also very easy to load this uh, data sets despite its size. Uh, most of the OGB data sets are in the order of uh, tens of millions of nodes, uh, but it uh, can be easily loaded with Python geometric, and we can also perform uh, mini batch or any other scalable GNN training on top of OGB. Um, and and the, uh, um, the OGB team and the uh, uh, PyG team also um, uh, created this KDD Cup uh, uh, challenge. It's also going to be uh, available for this year in Europe uh, uh, as, a, as a benchmark competition. And uh, uh, there are uh, so many, uh, many researchers compete on uh, using um, PyG and maybe other uh, gen and learning framework to um, to achieve state of the art on a, a given proposed uh, data sets, um, and and yeah, so so this is an ongoing effort and a large team and many people have been working on that, um, um, and and uh, if you have any feedback on the library, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, here are some um, more advanced features that I will uh, just briefly give an overview on. Uh, so the first one is on heterogeneous graphs. Um, so these are graphs that um, that consist of different node and edge types. For example, this is a conference graph where uh, uh, academic graph where we have uh, nodes that are related to papers, nodes that are related to authors. And authors are affiliated with the institution and uh, writes papers and paper size uh, among themselves. So, um, so this is a um, a graph that consists of multiple edge types as well as multiple nodes. And in order to learn these uh, these um, 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 learn on these kind of heterogeneous graphs, special support uh, will be needed. Um, uh, in order to model you know ways that are associated with different edge types and do message passing um, that takes in also into account of these message, uh, edge types and the second uh, uh, component is the graph chain uh, Jeffrey has already talked about it um, but it is also uh, already natively supported in PyG uh, we can use PyG to easily uh, so we can use graph chain to easily perform uh, auto ml related capabilities uh, for GNNs. Um, um, yeah, and, and there are several other um, uh, support for, for example, uh, uh, low precision and uh, uh, benchmarking runtimes and memory uh, and uh, uh, different kinds of models and uh, operators. Um, so for heterogeneous uh, graphs, um, we know that it is very challenging and um, 
most challenges are related to you know, having to model these type specific representations. We now have non-shared learnable weights that are across different node and edge types. So the every message, uh, message will be parameterized by uh, weights that are dependent on the node and edge type. And we also um, have to support this bipartite message passing uh, because uh, you know, we have uh, messages or edge types that only goes from one specific node type to another specific node type. And uh, this will form like a bipartite structure and the heterogeneous message passing will consist of multiple of such bipartite structure. Um, and, and there is also uh, the scalability approaches that are related to heterogeneous graphs. Now we now, instead of perform like general neighborhood sampling, we now have to do this relation-wise neighborhood sampling. Um, and finally, um, the implementation is complex because we need to uh, iterate over all these different node and edge types and retrieve all these weights uh, and, and, and compute um, the uh, messages for them. Um, and the goal of PyG is of course, to again, make this very simple. Um, and, and this is an example of how uh, a heterogeneous graph is uh, GNN is going to be implemented. And instead of a PyTorch geometric data object, we now use a hetero data object from Python geometric. And the heterogeneous uh, uh, heterogeneous data object is uh, uh, can or can just be um, uh, represented or seen as a dictionary essentially. So we can say like data uh, uh, index or key to a user. And then you can assign the uh, node feature uh, matrix for uh, all the users in, in the graph, right? It can be a tensor of number of users times the number of dimensions for each user. And again, you can also do it for product uh, node type and, um, and you can assign the uh, uh, node features. And uh, in addition to uh, node features, you can also assign uh, edge index, which is again, the uh, adjacency matrix for uh, uh, for the graph, but instead of uh, defining adjacency matrix for the entire graph, we now define adjacency as a bar by type structure. Uh, so these are specific edge types that are related to users and product. And we name this edge type as by relation. So this uh, will be all the list of all the transactions uh, between users and products. Um, and it is also very easy to, uh, to define them. We simply key, key it with a tuple user buys product and um, we index, uh, 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 we set the edge index as uh, a two times uh, number of edges like this uh, tensor, which is also uh, uh, the same as uh, homogeneous graphs. Um, and we also uh, support this um, uh, very easy operation called like two undirected, which makes this uh, graph undirected by adding all the reverse edge types. So, uh, so whenever there is a particular user buys a particular product, there is also a reverse relation from that product to that user through a re relation called maybe a reverse buy or something. Uh, so bought buy, for example. Um, so all of these are easily supported and you can see how it is uh, very easy to define this heterogeneous data object um, um, by using this kind of dictionary format. And, and in terms of message passing or a heterogeneous model, uh, um, the, the typical um, implementation is that we have uh, different uh, weights, learnable weights associated with different node types and edge types, right? For example, here, we can have user to user relation, which uses one set of weights as, the, uh, as shown by the vertical arrows. And on the other hand, we have the product uh, to product relations, which uses the weights uh, that are also on the, uh, uh, shown by the vertical arrows, but on the product side. And then we have those cross relations. So maybe user buys product, it will use these, uh, uh, um, these arrows from user to the product side, uh, right? To represent the learnable rates that are specific to this relation user buys product. And we have the reverse message passing as well. So we can also define another set of learnable weights from the product side to the user side through this uh, reverse edges. Um, and uh, the only thing to note here is that it's essentially very similar to a general GNN formulation, except this, uh, this summation operator here. Uh, so it will sum over uh, these different types of relations. And for each relation, we will have a message um, uh, and that the message is specific to that particular edge type or relation type. Um, um, yeah, and otherwise the, the GNN is the same except this uh, summation of all the uh, 
H type. And note that we do this for every layer, right? So at layer L, we have the summation of all H types to generate the representation of layer L plus one. And at layer L plus one, we again sum over all the relations to uh, generate representation for L plus two and so on. Um, and, and these are uh, some additional supports uh, uh, because state of the art uh, heterogeneous GNNs will also uh, use this uh, basis decomposition so that when we have extremely large number of uh, edge types or number of relations, uh, we can use this basis decomposition to avoid having an explosion of uh, learnable ways due to uh, you know, too, too many relation types. Um, and, and um, another thing that makes implementing GNs, uh, heterogeneous GNNs very easy is through this two hetero module. So what it does is it duplicates all the message passing module for an existing uh, existing GNN uh, so that we can uh, make it directly run on heterogeneous graph. Um, uh, because as we see, the only difference is the summation. So now after duplication of message passing with all the learnable weights, we are now able to uh, apply it to a heterogeneous uh, data object. Um, this is a very simple example, for example. Uh, so we're using this uh, graph attention um, um, network, and we define this module uh, as a graph attention uh, message passing uh, module uh, with the following number of parameters. And we all we need to do is to call this two hetero function uh, that takes in this uh, uh, homogeneous GNN module uh, with the uh, specific edge types and node types that are uh, related to the um, uh, to our uh, heterogeneous data uh, uh, data object, and we can now use two hetero function to convert it to the uh, heterogeneous uh, graph. And now we can directly apply uh, uh, this model to the uh, after two hetero call to a heterogeneous graph. Here. So X dict will be like all the node features for all the different node types, and edge index dict will be the uh, uh, all the edge index uh, for uh, different node, uh, edge types as well. And um, and yeah, like again, uh, all the uh, all, uh, all the things that we mentioned previously on scalable GNNs also apply to heterogeneous graphs. Uh, here we have the sampling. Um, um, uh, we still just need to call the neighborhood loader um, and. Um, and uh, in addition to the previous parameters, now we just need to pass in the uh, um, the number of neighbors for every edge type, right? So we, here we can see like for every edge type, we only sample 15 first half neighbor. And for each first half neighbor, we sample 10 second half neighbor and, and everything else remain unchanged. Um, so we provide a very complex, uh, a comprehensive uh, tutorial on how to use heterogeneous uh, uh, GNNs, and uh, we also show uh, uh, a like more comprehensive way of constructing heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, convolutions through this heterocon wrapper. Uh, you know that allows you to specify. You know, we can use different message passing operators for different edge types, but it will, it will be a more complex or advanced use case uh, than the two hetero function. Um, and we also uh, support let's say initialization. We support using uh, heterogeneous GNNs for uh, uh, together with PyTorch Lightning. And finally, we provide different kinds of uh, heterogeneous graph operators, such as heterogeneous graph transformer uh, uh, specific operators and uh, the corresponding samplers. Um, and uh, I will skip graph chain because it's already uh, being discussed. Um, and, and to conclude, uh, we have a um, a good library that uh, makes uh, GNN constructing a state of the art GNNs very easy. And it already bundles uh, 50 plus uh, GNN architectures, more than 200 benchmark data sets, uh, many dedicated CUDA kernels for accelerating GNNs. Um, and we have various other supports such as multi GPU, hard precision, and so on. Um, and finally, we also talked a little bit about heterogeneous graphs. Um, and and it also uh, natively incorporates the uh, GNN design space through GraphGen. Um, and, uh, and we welcome any pull request or any contribution. And if you haven't tried it already, um, you can uh, have a look and uh, um, install it uh, through uh, GitHub or through Conda and uh, uh, maybe uh, do some experiments on using it for uh, 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 creating your own GNNs. Um, and that's uh, that's it for uh, the uh, PyTorch geometric side. 
and uh, maybe I have uh, uh, 10 to 15 more minutes. So I will also, um, um, I will also um, share a little bit about uh, some research that we did on top of PyG. Um, so this is an example of, um, uh, how do I make it full screen? Okay, so this is an example of uh, using uh, GNNs for uh, this particular simulation task. And this is in collaboration with Stanford, uh, 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 Slack, uh, DeepMind, Saudi, and so. Uh, so, um, so I guess let's first talk about uh, like why simulation or why simulation is important in science and engineering. Uh, you know, in my opinion, there are many different kinds of uh, interactions that can be modeled through simulation. For example, we have those particle-particle interactions. Um, for example, in water simulation, uh, you know, uh, in graphics, it's typically represented as uh, particles. Uh, uh, in, in the scene and uh, these particles can interact and result in you know different uh, changes uh, to the uh, what uh, to the uh, uh, substance uh, in, in, in this particular environment and that is modeled through particle particle interaction and on the more cosmic scale we also have those uh, you know galaxy transformations and things like that where uh, you know stars interact with gravity through gravity and uh, that results in you know changes of uh, 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 their position, their uh, velocity, and so on. And these can also be represented as uh, a particle-particle uh, uh, -particle interaction because uh, all the forces exist between pairs of, uh, pairs of stars. And, and for these kinds of applications, we can typically use graphs to construct uh, 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 or to model this by modeling these particles as nodes and these interaction or these forces as edges. Right? And um, the second kinds of applications involves uh, things that uh, that are traditionally solved by partial differential equations, uh, you know, on the grid-like structure. For example, if you want to do a forecast of the weather through a long time range, uh, you know, uh, you have to uh, uh, discretize it on on the Earth through a grid, and then uh, model, uh, you know, uh, changes or uh, uh, changes of weather and uh, pressure and many different parameters on this grid structure. And same for aerodynamics and also uh, um, for reservoir simulation, which is uh, part of the uh, research that I will talk about here. And these typically uh, are uh, grid or mesh based. And we can construct graph based on the grid and mesh structure and make predictions of what ha will happen in the future over a long time range. And finally, there are also more complex physics uh, simulations, uh, which I will skip to for today. But these are like extremely uh, complex uh, systems that require uh, you know, both grid and particle to be involved because uh, on one side, you have you know particles that are related to protons, uh, atoms, and uh, electrons, and so on. But on the other hand, you also have grid structure that uh, represent things like force field, uh, electric field, magnetic field, and so on. So we need both uh, kind of grid or mesh-like structure and the particle information in order to simulate these kind of very complex uh, physical processes. Um, um, so yeah, again, these are very large scale simulation. And uh, the reason that we want to use uh, machine learning for it is uh, because we want to uh, accelerate these systems or make them, uh, make them tractable uh, uh, given this uh, extremely large data size, right? We, we can have, uh, 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 you know, for, for example, this uh, particular application will require 100 billion grid vertices, a trillion particles and, uh, you know, simulating over 10, uh, 100,000 time steps. Um, and, and even the largest simulation in the uh, high performance computing cluster uh, can only deal with, say, like uh, a tenth of that scale. And uh, most of them study at uh, hundreds of that scale, but we want to use machine learning to make uh, accelerations and make them tractable. And also, typically, it is uh, it has this multi-scale and dynamic range property. Uh, you know, on the high level, we have like some patterns that we also want to model in addition to those like low-level particle interactions. Um, and the goal for us is that uh, can we uh, accurately uh, make predictions uh, on a, the dynamics of a system um, and result in significant speed up compared to conventional modeling of simulation. So I will talk about like very uh, small applications and starting point of this. And there are uh, uh, there are like very exciting uh, researches done in this area. And uh, feel free to check out any additional uh, papers in this direction. I think it's a very exciting one. Um, so um, 
so this is a very simple project on graphics simulation well, uh, that we did uh, two years ago. Um, so given the initial condition of the particles, you know, which can be of different kinds of materials, it can be water, it can be sand, uh, group, and uh, different kinds of materials, can we simulate the evolution material? And uh, in graphics, we typically represent the particles of the uh, material um, um, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, calculate its movement through uh, interactions between the particles. So on the second line, we have these particle simulations uh, of our model. And the first line is a uh, rendering of the particles on uh, that we simulated on the second row. Right? And we can scale it to uh, you know, around 100K particles and different kinds of materials and simulate them over thousands of steps without uh, uh, you know, breaking uh, 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 the obvious physical rules here. And, and how do we use GNNs for making predictions of this? Um, first of all, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we step one model. So uh, at time, we want to make prediction of what will happen next in time t i plus one. And in order to do that, we collect a few frames of uh, historical information of uh, time i and uh, a few of the previous frames. And we use them um, uh, to make prediction on um, what happens at TI plus one. And uh, in order to do this, we first use an encoder, which first construct a graph. Um, and the graph is form, uh, formulated as uh, nodes as these particles, and uh, the edges are nearest neighbor edges. So uh, whichever uh, particles that are uh, close together, we will link them through an edge. And, and once we construct the graph, we can perform message passing. Uh, uh, so uh, the intuition is that we can propagate things like force uh, or uh, things like uh, velocity acceleration information through message passing. And uh, we are able to get uh, the uh, you know, net force or like whatever resultant uh, um, state of, the, uh, of each particle and use that to make prediction on the next step. And on the decoder side, we simply uh, compute the representations of each node uh, in the graph uh, after message passing and then use an multi-layer perceptron to decode things like position, um, velocity, and acceleration for the next time step. Uh, here's a little bit more detail. So as node input features, we also have position, uh, velocity, and particle type. Um, and and um, uh, for processor, um, we use a uh, message passing uh, function that uh, incorporates both the edge features and the node features. Uh, and, and we output the embeddings uh, and, and the decoder uh, decodes acceleration uh, according to the embeddings. And then we feed into an order integrator to obtain the position and velocity for that. Um, and, and using this training, we can actually perform tests uh, uh, by generalizing this model, right? So at every training step, we only train for one step. So given TI predict uh, what will happen at TI plus one, but at test time, we are only given the first frame. And now we use apply this learnable um, module multiple times uh, in order to predict the results for TI, uh, T1, T2, et cetera. Uh, so the output for T1, the prediction up, um, based on T1 will be used as an input uh, for the learnable module uh, at the second step to produce T2, T3, and so on. Uh, and in order to prevent error accumulation, we added this um, Gaussian noise um, uh, during training so that the model is able to handle these noisy inputs and will not um, uh, uh, cause uh, like uh, catastrophic error accumulation due to the fact that we are using predictions for uh, input at every time step. Um, and, and yeah, like here, here are some of the uh, results. Um, as we can see, uh, we are able to generalize across uh, multiple different materials after training, and uh, we can define you know, custom boundaries uh, because the model knows that, uh, like actually here, even in this uh, like one times one times one box or cube, uh, we have these uh, straight boundaries, but we can actually generalize them to uh, you know, arbitrary boundaries, and the model knows how to respect uh, this. Uh, uh, these boundaries and still produce uh, very reasonable uh, simulations given these uh, things that it has never seen. And additionally, as you can see, it can also simulate uh, interactions uh, across multiple different materials. Um, for example, we can, uh, we can interact the water together and it will to roughly reasonable uh, results. 
Um, and finally, it is able to uh, simulate across different kinds of uh, ground truth simulators. So our GNN with the same uh, model, same hyperparameters across all the data sets can simultaneously simulate, you know, SPH, MPM, and different kind of uh, graphics uh, uh, simulators. Um, and here is a uh, short example of how it actually looks. On the left, we have the ground truth. On the right, we have the prediction. And we can see that um, the uh, these are prediction after render, right? So this will be, uh, uh, we can see like the uh, prediction is roughly accurate. Um, it's not exactly the same if you look at all the details, like for example, on the right, there is some slight difference. Uh, but the point is that even after like very long uh, time range, it still looks reasonable, right? It, it, it looks plausible um, uh, as a prediction, although, uh, you know, in details, there are, uh, they are significantly different due to the intrinsic, uh, chaotic uh, properties of the system. And this is another example showcasing, uh, showcasing generalization in the 2D uh, scenario. So on the left, we are only trained on this very simple scenario where only have linear boundaries uh, in the unit cube. But on the right, we can see like different kinds of generalizations, you know, through uh, continuously adding water or through you know, dropping of different shaped water on uh, very weird and complex boundaries in a much larger uh, scenario. And we can see that because GNNs are able to do local interactions right, between the particle and these nearby particles, it is able to model this very complex scenario because uh, you know, at every um, uh, at every point uh, locally, it is able to learn like what the particle needs to go uh, based on its neighborhood. Right? Um, yeah, so I think uh, due to uh, time constraint, I will not go over the next simulation project uh, and I will skip to the uh, conclusion. Um, yeah, so um, uh, large, we believe that large scale simulations are important and GNNs can really uh, make a difference here and uh, accelerate these simulations in science and engineering domains. Uh, GNNs provides a very natural way to learn evolution of these, uh, these complex systems. Um, and um, and we are working on using the uh, 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 graph network simulator or the heterogeneous version of the graph network simulators uh, uh, on graph simul uh, so graphic simulation, reservoir simulations, and physical simulations to show their ability to learn very complex dynamics and generalization. And note that all of these are implemented in PyTorch ge uh, geometric, and uh, uh, you know, additional uh, materials can be uh, found there. Um, um, and, and, and sorry, uh, yeah, I think that's the end of the, uh, talk. So, um, 